I have a friend who likes to tell me frequently, tell me something I don't already know. And he does that whenever I'm preparing a talk or a presentation. And that's a very pressure thing because, you know, how do you tell somebody, how do you know you're telling somebody something they don't already know? But there's no pressure today because I have no intention of telling you things you don't know. I intend to tell you things you already do know, things that are common sense, things that are obvious, things that you may have tucked away in your mental attic uh, that need to be brought out, dusted off, and repurposed for a positive, for a positive force. So that's where I'm going to go today. Uh, the, talk, the title is Mobilizing Communities to Save Their Main Streets. Uh, we, know, we know what happened to Main Streets in America. I think be, the reason I'm here is because, as, as uh, you just heard, I, I spearheaded the organization called Raising the Bar, which won the National Small Business Revolution Contest last year. A million online votes were cast, and we won. And we did it with the help of a lot of people in the region. We appreciate that. So uh, I'm here to talk about Main Streets and what's happened to Main Streets. And you know the story of Main Streets across America. The story of Main Streets across America pretty much parallels what happened as the United States moved from an industrial to a post-industrial society. Uh, the factories closed, uh, jobs dried up, people moved out of small towns, people moved to the suburbs, and Main Streets, they didn't die, but they went into a pretty deep sleep. Fortunately, some government agencies did not lose uh, interest in Main Streets and did not give up on us. Uh, the United States Department of the Interior, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, the Bucks County Planning Commission, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, they all have wonderful plans, programs. How many of you have ever sat into a, one of those vision sessions where you sit around and talk about, gee, what could our town really be like and what could our Main Street really be like? They're nice. And there's good plans out there that you can adopt. I'm not here today to talk to you about what kind of plan you should adopt. That's your decision for your town and what your assets are. I am here to talk about the, the ingredient that those plans leave out. And what they leave out, the most important thing, is you. The most important thing in mobilizing any of these plans is the dedicated civil servants, civilians who are civic-minded people who want to get involved and want to step up. And that's what I want to talk about today, how to do that. Uh, I've developed an acronym. I'm Italian, so I called it Rome. I could have re repurposed the letters, reorganized the letters. Uh, but it stands for how to recruit, organize, mobilize, and empower people like you and me to get involved. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, get, I get weary of people who complain about, oh, you know, in our town there's so much apathy. People don't want to step up. People don't care. Uh, I don't believe that at all. I believe that every small town in America has very good people who want to get involved if they're empowered, if they're recruited, if they're made to feel welcome. And, and if they are, they're willing to give their time, talent, and their financial resources sometimes. And that's the important thing. Uh, so we developed our plan. We, we had a core group of people, and we selected a plan. And the very first thing we did, and I think it's important that every small town do this, uh, and I, that's to talk to your local government. You know, local government officials have the toughest job in America. Just ask them and they'll tell you, because they do. They can't go to the grocery store to buy a quart of milk without hearing about potholes and street lights that are broken and snow removal and trash pickup and all those problems. And it's not fun. And you don't run for office to fix a pothole. You run for office to be visionary, to make a meaningful change in your town. I like to make the analogy of a, of a school administrator who gets up in the morning, can't wait to go to school so he can affect people's lives, so he can inspire and motivate and encourage. And he gets into the building and he realizes the roof leaked the night before. And there goes his day. That's what he has to do. And that's no fun. And quite often, that's the life of a local official. So what we did, and it's very important to do, is we met with them to say, look, we're not here in an adversarial way. We're not here in a, in a confrontational way or to criticize. We're here to help. We're here to help you do the things that you wish you could do every day because it's an awesome job. And you know what? Most likely, they're, got, they're not going to believe you at first because when you, when you get criticized as much as local officials do, there's a good chance you start getting a little callous, you start getting a little defensive, you start getting a little suspicious of every group that pops up and what's their long-range political goals. So you need to convince them of it. And you don't just convince them with your words, you convince them with your actions moving forward. So we worked hard to form a partnership between local government and our civic group. The next thing, we had to address was the idea of branding. Branding is so important in marketing. And we were actually out to market our town and to market ourselves to the people that we wanted to get involved. So you had to pick a name. 
Someone suggested, why don't we call ourselves the Revitalization Committee? That was dead on arrival. To me, revi first of all, I've been, I've been around a while. I've been on about five or six revitalization committees. And it has a connotation to it that you're just about dead and, uh, and you need resuscitation, you need CPR. That's not the message you want to send for, for your town. So we, we brainstormed some names and we came up with the name Raising the Bar. Uh, we liked it because it has a connotation of effort, it has a connotation of something positive, it has a connotation of an ongoing thing, not you know, the idea that a, a person's reach should exceed their grasp. So we called it Raising the Bar. Uh, a volunteer said, how about this for a logo? We said, sure, why not? So that became our brand, that became our logo, that became our name, and I think any small town wishing to move forward and, 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 and motivate people, you need to consider that marketing part of a name and, and a logo, something visual. The next thing we talked about was, how do we convince people that this is just not one of those failed efforts that comes up every couple of years where people getting involved, they're going to change things and then nothing really happens. So we said, let's demonstrate something. The people need a visual demonstration, something tangible, that something good was going to happen. So we went back to the, to the borough again and we said, you got a vacant piece of land right at, the, right at the entrance of our commercial district, which is called Mill Street. How about letting us use the land? We want to build up, build a structure that will be a symbolic gateway, not only to the street, but to the future of our town, to the future change of our town. And they said, sure, go ahead. So we started out to raise money. My wife and I sold $30,000 worth of bricks, which told us, which we'll talk about in a minute, we used the funds to build the structure and do, and do some other things for seed money moving forward. But that effort showed two things, it showed the public that something tangible was happening. It wasn't a big deal, but it was something tangible that they could look at and say, I like that. And what it showed us is that there are people out there that want to participate. As we sold this idea, they bought in, literally, with their financial support. Uh, there's a guy named Jim Collins who wrote a book several years ago called Good to Great. And it was focused mainly on corporations and how you get a good corporation or a good organization to greatness. And we thought that there were some relevant pieces of that that would apply to us. And one of, the, one of the things he talked about was, you want to, you want to enhance your organization, you got to get the right people on the bus. And once you get the people on the bus, you got to get them in the right seats. So we didn't want a metaphorical bus full of people, we wanted a whole damn caravan. So we set out to recruit people as much as we could. And it's not an easy task, as, as those of you who are involved in civic groups probably know. Uh, we saw three challenges that, that are applicable to any small town in recruiting people to get involved. The first one is people often feel like they're really not wanted. That you, whether it goes back to middle school when they weren't in the clique or when they got cut from the basketball team or whatever it is, there, there's an inherent thing in some people that say, they don't want me. It's a clique. It's a separate group. They don't want me to be part of that. We had to convince people. We all have to convince people. We do want you. We want everyone who wants to step up and get involved. The second thing we think that, that deters people from getting involved is they're afraid about, what am I going to get sucked into? How much time is it going to be? I want to get involved in my town, but I'm busy, and I'm not sure I want to commit myself and then not be able to get out. So that's an important thing to consider. And the third thing is that there are people who felt, I want to get involved, but I'm not sure I have any skills to offer you. I don't know how to do the kinds of things perhaps you need done. So we adopted a motto, and this became our sales pitch, to everyone we wanted to recruit. We said, do only what you enjoy doing for only the amount of time you enjoy doing it. And we meant it. And when we, when we advertised for a volunteer, if we said, we want to hang flower baskets on Mill Street, we'd say, who can help for one hour on Saturday? And when that buzzer went off, we said, go home. We've done enough for today. And that, that caught on and people got involved. So that's an important thing. One thing about small towns is that they have a lot of roots. There's a lot of families that go back generations. And you know, you have new people moving into town. You have people that don't have those roots. And it's very, I, I, when I talk to people, I hear a lot of them say, you know, it's tough to break in to town. It's tough to be accepted or become part of the social circle or whatever. So uh, you have to be cognizant of that and welcome newcomers. And I mean really welcome them. One, I remember we were having a, a a meeting, we are going to have a town-wide cleanup, and we invited people to come because we wanted to get involved in the planning of it. We had 20 people show up, and I, you know, some people didn't know each other, so I said, why don't we go around the room like a Tupperware party and say, uh, just say who you are in one sentence about yourself. The first person said, 
you know, I'm John Doe and I've lived in Bristol all my life. The second person said, I'm Susie Smith and I lived in Bristol for the last 15 years. I said, stop. I said, we don't care if you've lived in Bristol for 15 years or 15 minutes. If you want to get involved, if you want to do something positive, if you want to step up, we've got a place for you. And we worked hard <clears throat> to convince people of that. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is an age inclusion. You know, everybody talks about, man, we've got to get, the, we've got to get young people involved. We have to get the millennials involved. Uh, it, and that's great, and we do. We need to get young people involved, we need to get the millennials involved. This town isn't for old people. But you know what? We learned something in winning this national contest, and we invented a new word. There are no senior citizens in Bristol. We call them perennials. Okay? So we have millennials and perennials. We want them both involved. And I can tell you that the people that carried the ball, I mean, everybody voted, you know, million votes cast and all that. Everybody voted uh, online several times, as you're allowed. But the people that showed up every day to say, what can I do to help? What do you need done today? What, what do you need distributed? We're people whose average age will qualify for AARP. So don't overlook the value of your older perennials in town. They have experience. They have a knowledge that, a skill that they can bring to the table. And I think most important, they've, they've, they've lived a life in, in the private sector or wherever they were, and they're looking for some fulfillment in retirement. You give them something good to do, and they'll feel fulfilled, and they'll be good workers for you. So you got to include them all. The next thing I want to make sure your organization is, is aware of is don't develop a big bureaucracy. We don't have a bureaucracy in raising the bar. We have a meritocracy. You show up. We, we have a board. You know, we have to pay bills. We have to pay insurance. We have to raise money. And we have a board to do that. But basically, when we deal with our larger group, you show up. You say you're going to do something. If you do it, man, you're a superstar. And if you don't, we understand. So we have people rising up all the time, and that's what we value. We had a new person just the other day. We're doing a fundraiser next week, and we needed somebody to recruit baskets for a raffle. And she said, I'll try it. And she was new to town. She came back with 20 baskets. She, she's she got a star, OK? That's important. Um, the other thing is, in, in, a, in a small town, uh, you know, I've talked to your, your rotary groups, Lions Clubs. They're shrinking. Good people who have done very good things, but they're shrinking. <clears throat> and we were cognizant of that. And we said, let's have a leadership breakfast. We invited two people from every organization in town that we could think of, service clubs, historic societies, firehouses, Little League, every the library, the museum, every organization we could think of said, send two people, let's get together for a breakfast. And we promise you'll be finished by 8.30 so you can go to work if you have to. And we met and we talked about how can we Take those, our, our collective desire to do good things in town, and how can we cooperate? How can we do some things jointly? How can we team up on some projects? And let's share our emails and our phone numbers so that when we want to communicate something, I can push a button and notify the president of every organization, and they can push another button and notify all their membership. That's a powerful thing. So we did that, and I, I, I encourage that for small towns. Develop a leadership network. Recognize the seed planters. No matter how hard we work, no matter how many good things we've done currently, we know that there are people who went before us who maybe kept us on life support when our towns were really struggling. They did good things. And if they didn't get them all done, they really tried like heck. And we think it's important. You're never smarter than when you recognize somebody else for their achievement, right? Your estimation of them goes up sky high. We worked very hard to recognize the people that came before us, the people that turned an art theater, for lack of a better word, right, an X-rated theater in the community to a, a wonderful award-winning performing arts theater. That, I mean, that was a milestone moment. And we don't want to take that for granted. So we remind people today of the things that were done in the past as a way to inspire them to what else can we do moving forward. When you see a good idea, steal it, by all means. We invited a... a Governor James Malley from Collingswood, New Jersey, to come to speak to our group. And Collingswood's a wonderful success story. It's a town like ours, like Bristol, where there was an old industrial town, and it's transforming itself. It's doing great. And he was a driving force behind it. So we brought him to town. We we're having a question and answer period. And they have a theater in Collingswood. So one of our, one of our uh, guests said, how did you get a, th and they, they have a theater district, one theater, they have a theater district. And they said, well, how did you get a theater district? He said, what do you mean? We put up a sign that said theater district. And it, sound, and it sounds cool. 
And so we said, okay, let's, let's do that. We have a wonderful theater, and we decided to just change the name a little bit. Uh, we call it our cultural corridor because we have a theater and a museum and, and, and monuments along the riverfront. But we call it the Bristol Borough Cultural Corridor. We made literature that we could give to tourist groups, come and visit the cultural corridor. It's the same things that were there before, and they're wonderful, but we repackaged them, repurposed them, and, uh, and that's a good idea. So you see any good idea, by all means steal it, right? Imitation is the best form of flattery. Building a regional network. Um, we reached out. There are so many organizations out there, and everybody wants to be recognized. Everybody wants to be seen, you know? So we reached out to the Silver Lake Nature Center, to the Pensbury Society, to every group, to, to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Lower Bucks Chamber of Commerce, any group we could to visit Bucks County and say, hey, we're here, this is who we are, and we want to part, be part of what you are. And they appreciate that. And we've reaped much more in benefits than we've given in time. So it, it, I strongly encourage that. Reach out if you're not already. You recognize her? That's Debbie Downer from Saturday Night Live. You remember Debbie Downer? Uh, she would ruin any party, any, any meeting. Uh, one of my favorite skits of hers was a group of people are out to dinner, and they're all happy, and they can't wait to talk to each other. And, and uh, one says, I think we're going to have a steak and a beer. Somebody else says, yeah, steak and a beer sounds good. And everybody's going to have a steak and a beer. And Debbie says, well, I would have one, but then I've been reading about mad cow disease, and I think I'm going to pass on it. Okay? When you see a boo bird, because you know what they are, you know there are people out there that will shoot holes in anything you want to do, who will criticize you from their couch without getting off it, just run away from them as fast as you can. If you have one in a meeting, thank them politely and show them the door, because you've got work to do. We don't have time for naysayers. Now, there's a difference between accepting legitimate criticism and having different points of view. That's one thing. But once you get the feeling, this isn't working well, and don't spend your time on social media arguing with the naysayers. You, have, you don't have enough time to do that. Spend your time doing the positive thing that you believe in, and the naysayers will drift away. The toughest thing is when you have some success, and we've had some success, is sustaining it, to keeping the dream alive, to keeping the buzz alive. To say, you know, we won this wonderful contest, half a million dollars, we got national recognition, we've been part of an eight-part video series on... On a, on, a, on a cable network, I'll say it like that. Uh, but, uh, and that's great. That can't be the peak. That was yesterday. We need to move forward. We need to do more good things. We need to keep people enthused. So remember, the most important part of your town's advancement is not the plan, it's the people. So best of luck, and thank you for having me.